We are live, Mayor. It's all yours. Great. Good evening and welcome. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council meeting. This is a regular meeting. It is Tuesday, October 27th, 2020. It is 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being held via teleconference. And I will ask the clerk to establish a quorum, please. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Addis? Here. Council Member Davis? I am present. Council Member Heller? Here. Council Member McPherson? Here. And Mayor Henning? Present, and thank you. Uh, pursuant to Section 3 of Executive Order N-29-20, issued by Governor Newsom on March 17, 2020, this meeting will be conducted telephonically through Zoom and broadcast live on channel cable channel 20 and streamed to the city website. Please be advised that pursuant to the executive order and to ensure the health and safety of the public by limiting human contact and that could potentially spread COVID-19 virus, the Veterans Hall will not be open for the meeting. Thank you and welcome. And with that, I'd like to call for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Um, and Madam Clerk, if you'll raise the flag, um, I'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, and uh, thank you. And with that, um, I'll ask our city attorney, Mr. Niermeyer, do we have a closed session report? Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. No closed session items to report tonight. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. That'll take us to council member um, reports. Um, I'll go ahead and lead off. Um, it's been um, a couple of weeks since um, I've given an update on COVID-19 to the community. Thought this would be a good opportunity this evening. Um, as of today, um, there are 4,191 cases of COVID-19 that have been confirmed in San Luis Obispo County. Um, there are, uh, at present, um, 32 deaths have occurred in the city, excuse me, in the county. Um, Currently, there are seven individuals hospitalized. One of those individuals is in the ICU. To date, we've had 204 people hospitalized during the, the pandemic, um, and 40 people have um, gone to the ICU during the pandemic period. There is um, an adequate supply of hospital beds, including ICU beds and ventilators throughout the county, should there be a spike in cases. At present, the uh, San Luis Obispo County itself is in the state's tier two, which is the red tier that is considered, uh, quote, substantial with regard to COVID-19 penetration in the, in the county. Um, we are approaching the uh, possibility of moving to tier three, which is a better tier, that is the orange tier considered to be um, a moderate. Our case rate per 100,000 in the county is four. Um, in order to move from our current tier two to a more favorable tier three, we would have to remain at um, four cases or less per 100,000 for a period of two consecutive weeks in order to again move to tier three. In addition to that, um, our positivity rate with regard to um, the total county um, and the number of positive tests is 2%. That also qualifies us to move to tier three. Um, you must be under 5% in order to move into tier three. And we have been uh, pretty much at 2% for um, a couple of months or so. Um, and so that indicator is going very well. 
The uh, third indicator would be the testing data um, in, in Slow County. We are averaging 434 cases per 100,000. That is almost twice the state median, which is um, approximately 239. And so uh, we have a very high testing rate. Um, our, our case rate per 100,000 is approaching the area where we might be able to move towards that more favorable tier, which could occur in about uh, two weeks because we just now hit that, hit that number. It was slightly higher um, a few days ago at about um, 4.5, and it is coming down. I thought um, there might be some interest in the percentage per community. This is um, taking into consideration the total population of a city and giving you the percent positive rate in that community. Um, as I noted, um, in San Luis Obispo County, 2% um, of all individuals tested, or 2% of the population, I should say, um, it has been positive or tested positive. Um, compared to the state of California, the positivity rate is 2.2%. Um, so the slow county is, is, again, less than the state of California. That's favorable. The death rate in California is 1.9%. And the death rate in San Luis Obispo County, uh, fortunately, is, is only 0.8%, um, a little less than half of the death rate for California. Looking at the percent positive uh, just by a number of selected communities, maybe from the highest to some of the lower uh, communities, um, the city of Paso Robles um, just over a week ago had a 2.8% uh, positivity rate for their population. Um, as of this past week, they are at 3%. That's the highest percent positive case rate um, in the county. That's the city of Paso Robles. Compared to the city of Atascadero, which has a positivity rate of 1.25% um, about a week and a half ago, and remains at uh, close to that at 1.3%, being more favorable than San Luis Obispo County's 2% and the state's 2.2% rate. San Luis Obispo, the city of, um, uh, has a uh, positivity rate of 1.6%, again, lower than the county average. The city of Napomo um, has a case rate positivity at 2.2%, the same as the total county. Uh, of the beach communities, Pismo Beach has a positivity rate of 0.78%. Again, uh, very low compared to the state average of 2.2 and the county average of 2.0. The city of um, Morro Bay has the second lowest case rate in the county at 0.6%. Again, compared to Pismo Beach at 0.78%. The lowest case rate um, of any city um, in San Luis Obispo County is um, the city of Los Osos with a case rate positivity at 0.43%. So the, the summary is, is that um, San Luis Obispo County is trending favorably compared to state uh, data. Um, it looks like we might be able, um, within the next two weeks, to move from Tier 2 into Tier 3, a more favorable tier, that, that could um, um, have more reopening opportunities, more capacity opportunities for businesses, um, et cetera, as long as that case rate per 100,000 remains at four or less. And that seems to be the one that we we are teetering on right now with regard to our case data and um, being able to move into that more favorable tier. Thank you, hopefully that is helpful. I wanted to thank the city of Morro Bay for um, adhering to the guidelines um, um, as set down by the CDC, um, the public health department and the state health department. Um, Continue to wear a mask whenever you're outside, especially if you're not able to socially distance yourself within six feet from another individual, not within the same household. Uh, frequent hand washing is a necessity. 
Um, and in addition to that, I might just let you know that um, through contact, contact tracing done by the county uh, of San Luis Obispo, the number one cause for transmission or the number one opportunity for the virus to be transmitted is when um, small group gatherings occur with more than three different households that gather um, and and often meet in a contained space. And so whenever possible, if you are gathering with friends, limit the numbers of individuals that gather together. Um, remember to wear masks, socially distance, and you should not have more than three different households represented. Um, and if you can, possibly meet outside. Thank you, that ends my report. And I'll move to Council Member Davis, sir, your report. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, the only thing I have tonight is that I will hold office hours this coming Saturday at the Giant Chess Board from 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, anyone is welcome to come and talk to me about any subject. Please wear face covering. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You bet. Thank you for that. Uh, Council Member Heller, sir, your report. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I have nothing to report. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Council Member Addis. I don't really have anything to report either, but folks are welcome uh, to email me at donaddis for city council at gmail.com or uh, send me a message. Check my Facebook, Don Addis City Council. If they have issues they'd like to chat with me about, I'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you for that. And um, Council Member McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, you know, one of the greatest traditions here in Morro Bay is the annual free uh, community Thanksgiving dinner. And I just wanted to report that it is going to take place this year. Um, and the, the date will be November 26th at the Morro Bay Community Center. But unfortunately, unlike in previous years where hundreds of people were able to eat together indoors, this year it will not be in person because of COVID. So there will be curbside pickup between 1 and 3 p.m. And there will be free home delivery, emphasize free, from 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. And so if you're interested in getting that free Thanksgiving Day meal, you should call 805-225-5044 and leave a message uh, with your address. Um, it's also uh, true that the Morro Bay Lions Foundation will be giving away its free car. And this is something that they do four times a year. Uh, and I think I've talked about this uh, program before. Bill Todd of Todd's Garage fixes up uh, old cars that people have donated. And the Morro Bay Community Connections Office screens the applicants for the cars. And they've given away, uh, I think, about 25 or 26 cars at this point in time. So it's a great program. If you have a car to donate, uh, you should uh, get a hold of Bill Todd at Todd's Garage. And if you think you qualify for the car, uh, you should call 805-225-1991 and you will receive an application. Um, and I do want to just send a shout out to all of the folks that helped to sponsor the annual Thanksgiving Day dinners. Uh, it's a, it, it really takes a village and we can see it from this list. It it includes the City of Morro Bay, the Morro Bay Chamber of Commerce, Albertsons, AGP Video, Casa de Flores, Dorn's Restaurant, Mia Casa Restaurant, the Morro Bay Police Officers and Police Volunteers, the Morro Bay Maritime Museum, and the Morro Bay Lions Club and Foundation. So thank you all. That's my announcement. Thank you, Council Member. And we'll move to uh, Mr. Collins, our city manager. Any reports, sir? No, Mayor, no report tonight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. With that, we will move to um, general public comment. This is public comment for items on the agenda for which you will not have the opportunity to speak uh, as that agenda item comes up or for items other than items on the agenda you'd like to uh, speak about. Um, in order to prevent and mitigate the effects of COVID-19 pandemic and limit potential spread within the city of Morro Bay in accordance with executive order N29-2020, 
2020, the city will not make available a physical location from which members of the public observe the, may observe the meeting and offer public comment. Remote public partition, participation excuse me, is allowed and uh, the information for accessing that has been placed on the screen by our city clerk and be sure to uh, push the raised hand feature. Um, if you're calling in, that's star nine to raise your hand or clicking on the raise hand feature if you're um, asking to come in via Zoom. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, I will open up a general public comment. Again, this is public comment for items uh, not on the agenda that you'd like to speak about and or um, items on the agenda for which you cannot state. With that, Anthony, do we have uh, public comment? Uh, yes, Mayor. I see a couple hands starting to be raised here. Um, Sean Green, I'm going to go ahead and bring him up now just a moment. Okay, Sean, you are live. You're free to give your testimony, please. Thank you, Council. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you and a uh, big thanks to uh, Morro Bay and Bloom for the uh, roundabout scarecrows and haystacks. I know they had beautified that area. Um, a couple years ago with the flowers and those are permanent. And then they also cycle through uh, seasonal uh, installations, which, you know, it's such a small thing, but it makes such a big difference in this town. And, um, you know, along those same lines, it does seem like there's, there are fewer and fewer residents that stockpile six cars in their yard or may, or fail to maintain their yard. And so it, whether, you know, when it comes to businesses and residences, I just very much appreciate those that take the time to not only take care of their space, but also uh, go above and beyond by uh, in putting out season, uh, seasonal installations that really, you know, spice up uh, any block that they're on. So thank you very much to all those people, especially Morro Bay and Bloom. Thank you, Sean. Um, Anthony, next public comment, please. Yes, Mayor. Uh, Betty Windholtz is the next uh, person Welcome to give her testimony. Betty, you are live. Thank you. This is Betty Winholtz. Um, I'm calling on a different note. Um, I want to express my continued disappointment that people are continuing to take down groups of signs. I'm assuming it's because they don't agree with them. And I think that couldn't be much more un-American than to stop other people from having their opinion, um, including um, a neighbor up on Kern Street who had a flag that someone would have had to trespass over her property in to her driveway and reach up on her railing to yank down a sign. And I, I just think that regardless of how you feel politically, we all have the right to have our speech. And I think that um, it's time for us to grow up and not do this kind of activity anymore. Thank you, Betty. All right. Public comment. Uh, Mayor, next we have Linda Winters. Okay. Linda, you are live. Welcome, Linda. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Winters, and it's been a long, long time since I've made any kind of public comment. I've missed it very, very much. I just wanted to let everybody know that um, I've not been in uh, out in the public, but I've been working... Uh, very hard with um, a lot of different people here in the city to help build our um, mobile home park communications network. And uh, we've got about half of them that are uh, we, we are um, in communication with. And um, I also want to thank um, Jennifer Calloway. Uh, although I am terribly disappointed she's she's leaving us, I am so thankful that she helped to build the utility rebate program and to the city council for uh, expanding um, the re rebate amount that um, our people are very much in need of. That's been absolutely fantastic. And um, uh, basically, I, I am incredibly pleased with the amount of people that have already gotten out to vote. We have such a tremendous spirit of patriotism uh, for 
for all of us and to help keep our our city safe and sound. And I hope everybody is well in this crazy times. And um, I just want to let you all know that I am alive and well and will continue to um, work on mobile home parks. And there are a few um, new uh, ordinances, or it's actually laws that have been enacted as far as mobile home parks. And I'm anxious to sit down and talk to all of you about it sometime in the future. That's all for now. Thank you, Linda. Um, Anthony, next public comment, please. Uh, yes, Mayor. It looks like we have one more, uh, Mr. Robert Piotti. Okay, Robert, you are live. Welcome, Robert. I believe I unmuted. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Robert Piotti. I'm a member of the Salinan, Salinan tribe of Morro Bay and uh, San Luis Obispo and Monterey counties. And I'd uh, like to address the council regarding the monitoring of cultural resources at the construction site of the wastewater treatment plant along Highway 1. Um, as representatives of the people of Morro Bay and in response to uh, state law AB 52 and other regulations, a decision was made I have a menu popping up, excuse me. There we go. Uh, to begin uh, construction and have three separate Native American uh, Indian groups monitor the construction at the wastewater site. And rather than have them do it simultaneously, each group was basically told they would monitor one phase of the construction. And now near the completion of phase one, um, the agreement has changed so that all three groups will monitor on some sort of rotational schedule. Um, our group, the Salinan tribe, have documented evidence to the land. Uh, my ancestors go back. We've proven our village sites. Uh, one of the other groups has a village site in Avila Beach. We have sites in Morro Bay and, and Toro Creek and many others. The third group, we're not aware that they have any documented village sites. Um, we asked the city council to go back to their previous agreement, as erroneous as we felt it was, of having each group monitor one phase rather than sharing the phase for the benefit of one group that now feels they will be left out. And we look forward to hearing that this will be resolved in such a fashion. And I would like to answer any questions if that's allowed, or I look forward to hearing more from you. Uh, thank you, Robert. We don't do Q&A on public comment, but I have taken notes uh, regarding your concerns, so I appreciate that. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more. No, good evening. Uh, Anthony, any other public comment? Mayor, I do not see any more raised hands. That looks like it's it. Okay. With that, I will go ahead and close public comment, bring it back to council, and perhaps um, Mr. Collins, uh, might you comment um, with regard to um, Mr. Piotti's uh, concern and uh, maybe update us on that issue regarding the site monitoring at the WRF uh, project? Yeah, um, I can't comment on all the specifics, so I'd, I would need this individual to contact the program manager of the warfare, Caceres, but uh, we are attempting to balance all the uh, different interests in uh, the monitoring and the different tribes to ensure equity as much as we can, and that's what we're going to carry forward throughout the remainder of the project. Okay, and uh, Mr. Caceres uh, would be best reached by email, would that be correct? Yes. Oh. All right, thank you very much. With that, um, that moves us to item A, the consent um, agenda. Um, I will um, open up public comment. This is public comment for any item on the consent agenda only. Um, if you'd like to give public comment, um, now would be the time. Anthony, any uh, public comment? Mayor, excuse me, Mayor, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. Thank you. With that, I will close public comment for the consent agenda, bring it back to council, and uh, ask if there are any items to pull. And if not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Motion by council member Addis to approve uh, items A1 through A4 on consent. Second by council member Davis. Any discussion? If not, uh, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Addis? Yes. Councilmember Davis? Yes. 
Council Member Heller? Yes. Council Member McPherson? Yes. And Mayor Hitting? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. It brings us to item C on our agenda. These are uh, business items. Um, first item is C-1. This would be adoption of ordinance number 640, amendments to Morro Bay Municipal Code to repeal chapter 5.47, the short-term vacation rental permit, and adding chapters 17.41, short-term vacation rentals, so as to provide regulations to protect the quality and character of our residential neighborhoods through application of density limitations, expanded permit requirements, and operational requirements. Um, just a reminder that this is um, the second reading of the ordinance. This ordinance um, um, originated um, over many years of discussion with the community, as I believe um, uh, most of us um, know including the uh, convening of a special panel by our city manager um, that uh, spent many, um, actually months, um, with myself and council member McPherson asking, acting as facilitators to make recommendations regarding the ordinance. And I'm very grateful to that group for that. Um, this also has been vetted in detail through the TBID board, um, during which time public camp comment was taken, um, through um, two meetings of the uh, uh, Planning Commission. Uh, again, um, these were public hearings and public comment was taken. And then now this would be the third meeting, um, two prior meetings regarding this specific ordinance that appears tonight, um, during which public comment was taken during a public hearing. And so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to um, either Mr. Deermeyer or Mr. Collins for presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Honorable Mayor, City Council. Tonight's staff report on this item uh, will be brief as this is the second reading or adoption of ordinance number 640. As the mayor just succinctly uh, um, stated, uh, this ordinance is the result of months and months of work and review by the community and uh, a subcommittee and uh, TBID and other groups uh, took a look at this ordinance. And then the council itself um, on September 22nd was presented with a draft ordinance. And after vigorous public uh, discussion and council discussion, there were some modifications made. Um, on October 13th, council also had a uh, potential um, introduction of the ordinance. And again, there was a lot of public comment and a lot of council discussion. Uh, some changes were made on the floor at the October 13th meeting. Um, those include in brief uh, changes to multifamily STRs, uh, separation requirements, uh, accessory dwelling units, and noise. And those changes were made on the floor October 13th, and the ordinance was uh, introduced for a first reading. And tonight we have that ordinance before council for second reading or adoption. And if it is adopted tonight by a majority of the council, then the ordinance will be effective uh, 30 days thereafter. That concludes my report. And I, of course, am available for any questions from the city council. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for that overview again. And with that, if there are any city council member questions, I will open it now to uh, council questions and then move to public comment once again. So let me start with council member Addis. Um, any questions? I do not have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Davis, any questions? No, Sarah, I have no questions. Great. Council member Hiller, any questions, sir? Uh, I do have some questions. Okay. I have my new background, my photo of Morro Bay. Your haircut looks good. Nothing historical about it particularly, I guess. <laughs> so um, in looking at the staff report on page 16, it um, talks about ADUs in the residential areas being grandfathered in and included in the cap of 175. Uh, one question I have that I couldn't seem to sort out are existing multifamily um, units grandfathered in, in in residential areas, and are they also part of the 175 cap? 
Uh, Council Member Heller, uh, that's a really good question. Um, any existing ADU, uh, whether it be uh, multifamily, an ADU, um, single family dwelling, an existing STR that is in good standing with the city uh, and has their permit in good standing, uh, they will be grandfathered in. Uh, this is in section 17.41.050, uh, uh, page eight of the ordinance or page 25 of the, uh, the agenda. Um, and the broad language of the uh, grandfathering in is just simply anyone in good standing right now is grandfathered in. Okay, and then that's part of the 175? Um, yes, those will count towards the 175. Okay. Um, let's see here. And what what is the expectation on, on the city's part in terms of how long it will take to transition from the 250 to the 175? Are there any expectations on how long that will take or? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I would defer to city manager on that or community development director. Um, I think all, all signs point to that occurring within the next year based on um, the requirements that are outlined in the new ordinance and the fact that uh, those home shares are being taken out of the cap. I, I think we get down to 175 within the year is my estimation. Uh, Scott, do you have a similar view on that? Uh, you know, I agree. I think that's accurate. I mean, it, it, it would be within, certainly within the next two years, I would think. I mean, one year seems likely, but if it goes a little bit longer, it wouldn't be much longer, I would think, with the attrition rate we currently have. Okay. Uh, on page 17, the staff report, item 4A, uh, addresses noise rules. I'm not sure what this means when it says the noise rules per local code expressly ap applied to short-term rentals. Does, does the look is the local code going to be revised to include language that has to do with short-term rentals or is it there already or noise is such an issue i'm not clear about this sure uh, so the uh, str ordinance um, is making the noise rules and other sections expressly applicable through the str ordinance to guests uh, vacation rentals so what that means is that it's the same rule that applies everywhere in the city that basically uh, there can't be loud noise from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., which is in another part of the code. But if that rule is violated by uh, a guest of an STR, uh, enforcement can occur through the STR ordinance, as opposed to uh, if a resident of Morro Bay violated the noise rules, they would be subject to um, uh, penalties in other parts of the code. So we wanted to make sure that the noise rules, if there's a problem, could be enforced through this legislation, um, which you know could end up resulting in a permit being suspended or revoked. Um, you know we can bring abatement actions. Um, you know there, there's a lot of strict enforcement action. So um, it's the same rule that applies to everybody that's in the city, whether they're at an STR, they live here, um, you know they're just visiting. Okay, so does the noise, the current noise code have quantitative metrics to determine what is noisy or what's too noisy or what's not noisy or how's that determined? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, it doesn't have any decibel, um, uh, any decibel um, uh, metrics in it and uh, pursuant to uh, council request at the last meeting, um, staff uh, will be bringing back at some point, um, you know, proposed revisions or at least a discussion of the current noise ordinance, which was written about 40 years ago. And the current noise ordinance, if I remember, it's in chapter 9.28 or thereabouts. Um, it doesn't have a decibel um, metric in there. It, it's more of a reasonable person test of whether you know the noise is being bothersome from a, a distance of, I think, 50 feet. Um, but I believe what you're getting at, council member, is you know, could we... Um, modernize the noise code and I think there's room for that and uh, the request to council at the last meeting um, when staff uh, is able to bring forward um, revisions along those lines or at least a discussion report uh, that will be done. Okay yeah I think you know from a code enforcement standpoint I don't know how a code enforcement officer is going to enforce a noise uh, ordinance if they're not metrics involved uh, 
you know, I just don't. So I'm you're absolutely that, correct. The, hoping the, the, that'll the, come the, forward soon because uh, that's a key issue, a uh, key complaint made by people who live near some of these full home rentals. You're absolutely right. It's a lot simpler to have those metrics than to just what does a reasonable person uh, think. And also, I wanted to clarify, I didn't want to create any misunderstandings on the 175 cap. Um, the homes subject to the 175 cap are full home short-term vacation rentals, and then ADUs are included in there. Um, but uh, the way it's written right now, the, the cap is on full home short-term vacation rentals. Right. Uh, page 21 at the top, it talks about meeting California residential code and that each bedroom has a window opening used for egress. Does this mean that um, bedrooms with windows will have to have the current fire code sill height requirement and opening requirements that are required for any other uh, structure, uh, occupied residence that's being constructed? You know, I'll defer to uh, Community Development Director Graham for uh, that one. No, we just need to be um, able to exit the windows for the older homes. We didn't make the thing specific to current code requirements. They just need to be able to be um, used for um, for a second means of egress. So aren't we, if we don't comply with current fire codes with respect to window egress, aren't we exposing the city to liable, liability uh, issues? Um, the homes exist, and we have the allowance for short-term rentals in our code. Um, so it's not a there's not there's not an issue as it relates to that necessarily. Those homes are are existing and were built you know many years ago, or some of them are more recent and do meet the code requirements. Um, as long as you can you can use them for egress, though, it's it's acceptable. Hmm. Okay. Um. Uh, on page 21, also in definition of home sharing rentals, I was confused about the language that says any unit in a multifamily of no more than four units where the host lives in one unit or primary residence. Can you explain that to me? Is that, I just don't understand that at all. It's on page 21, Chris. Sure. Um, so if it is a, a multifamily dwelling with four units, uh, so let's say you had a four unit uh, condominium complex, um, you can qualify for a home, home sharing rental if one of, if the owner basically lives in one of those. But uh, the intent I believe is to make sure that you don't have like say a, you know, a 20 unit apartment building. And, you know, just because the owner lives somewhere on the, in those 20 units, it would qualify as home sharing. So it's so in other words, if I, if I, if I was a, uh tenant in a four a fourplex i could do home sharing in my unit is that what that means or yes i believe so uh scott would you agree with that <clears throat> yeah no i think so i mean i'll be subject to the owner of the building's you know authorization but yes okay if i if i owned the building could i make the other three units uh home uh no they would not be home shares would they well, we have the uh, we have the uh, rule uh, applied on top of this. We have the one eighth rule. So, um, you know, th this talks about home sharing. But if uh, the landlord uh, is off site, then uh, their multi units are subject to the one eighth rule. So, you would have to uh, only, you can only allow one of the eight to be rented. Um, this is if you want to take advantage of the home sharing. Um, rule, which, you know, obviously is more liberal because the assumption is if you are living at the site, then uh, you're going to um, uh, certainly be able to enforce the rules theoretically easier. Okay. Um, so if I owned a four unit building, I could do the three units as home shares since I'm living in the building. I mean, is that possible? Just like no, a guest I, house. I, guest I, house. I believe that you could only do you could only use one of those four. Uh, the issue here, I guess, would be whether uh, it's a home share or a full home. Okay. Uh, then on page one, we're talking about local contact person, mm -hmm. um, and it talks about initiating correction with one hour being notified and so forth. One of the big complaints we get about full home rentals 
is that the response is slow or it's very late or and, and when I look at other ordinances, this really is the longest time period in any of them. And many of them have a, a shorter response time. Uh, specifically, there's one that requires a 15 minute uh, phone call and the person has to show up within 30 minutes. Uh, I mean, could we include this? Could we tighten up this restriction? I mean, the one hour to me seems kind of weak. That's uh, entirely a policy decision. Um, I think the city manager could speak to uh, how that uh, uh, number emerged from the months of the committee that worked on this, though. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we did look at this pretty closely. The, the existing ordinance is four hours. We felt that was... Uh, that was not sufficient. Uh, one hour was what the group recommended from the, uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, the community committee that, that reviewed all this stuff. They felt one hour to initiate um, the complaint and, and for somebody to follow up, start the follow-up process was sufficient. And of course, you know, if there's a, a bigger issue, um, the cities also could become involved, whether it's the police or code enforcement. So, uh, but the onus is upon um, the owner and or their representative to initiate uh, a response within one hour. Um, I'm assuming most of them would occur quicker than that, but uh, we felt something that was was uh, of a shorter time frame would be we may be infeasible for some folks. So it's uh, as Chris said, it's largely or entirely a policy decision. So the one hour within one hour could be just a phone call, right? From yeah, and it's well, it's an issue. You got to begin. It's it's you got to begin the process. So um, we require that there be somebody in in the city who can do that, a local contact person. So it's more than just saying you know somebody who lives out of state. It's somebody locally who can can initiate the uh, you know some kind of uh, fix for an issue, or at least uh, go out and see what's going on. Okay. Uh, then on page two, uh, talking about property owner, what it means to be a property owner. So it says means person or entity holding single or unified beneficial title to a property. Not being a lawyer, Chris, can you explain to me, we've talked about this a bunch, whether an individual or a trust of an individual can hold a property, but when you get to LLCs and corporations and so forth, that's different. Can you explain what this means to me? Sure. So um, basically the property owner is uh, who holds the title. So uh, the title could be held by uh, what the law considers to be a fictitious person. It could be an LLC, a corporation, um, which under the law, they're people. Uh, they're, they're not living, hu living, breathing human beings, of course. But um, this means that uh, the property owner doesn't have to be a human being. The property owner, like, you know, property in general could be held in the name of a trust, an LLC, a corporation, et cetera. Okay, so that's what unified beneficial title means, basically? Yes, single or unified. So there could be multiple, uh, um, there could be multiple uh, parties, of course, in the LLC. There could be multiple members of the LLC or, you know. Uh, I'm trust. correct. This, this ordinance does not prohibit a single property owner or entity from owning, holding title to multiple full, full home rentals in Morro Bay. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, page 23, permits not transferable. We've talked about this a lot. Can you tell me again how this will be enforced? How does this actually work in practice? So uh, I think that uh, the rubber will hit the road uh, when the annual renewal needs to come up. And um, if the actual entity uh, or person that uh, is the property owner were to change, then um, the, that permit would not be subject to uh, a renewal, um, even if everything else is in compliance. Um, obviously, if uh, there was some sort of complaint made or notice was provided to the city, then uh, there could be review. Um, I'm not certain on whether or not the the web crawler activity where the city is seeing if there are unlawful uh, residences being, uh, if, if, when the city, the city does have a, um, a consultant that checks the internet to see if there are uh, rentals available and they don't have a local permit. Um, I don't know if that actually checks on this part of it, but uh, certainly at the annual renewal is when uh, um, the paperwork would need to match up where you wouldn't get a renewal. Okay, and I think there's there's nothing in the ordinance that prevents real estate agents from advertising properties 
as licensed to vacation rentals. Is that right? We never really addressed that issue. You mean what entitles them to say, quote, it's a licensed vacation rental, end quote? If it's a licensed rental, they can say that, right? Sure, if they have a local license, um, I, I don't see any reason why they, they couldn't make that representation. Okay. Uh, also on page 23, item H, it talks about the city providing information to the public regarding short-term rentals. Um, Scott or somebody, can you tell me, you know, what information do you plan on posting and how it's going to be available to the public? We plan on having a, a page, um, you know, that's dedicated to vacation rentals and they're in the process that we use to um, administer to the, the provisions of this code. Um, and we would be having, we'd also have a list posted of all um, licensed vacation rentals. Um, so people can verify that, that, you know, the property next to them is or isn't a vacation rental. If they think it's an illegally operating one, they can call code enforcement and we can investigate it and determine whether that's actually the case or not. So that's kind of the idea behind posting the, the list and addresses of licensed vacation rentals. Okay. Um, you know, page 25 talks about the separation of 175 foot radius. Um, ref refresh my memory, does this density separation uh, requirement apply to home shares uh, as well as uh, full home rentals? It applies right. to full home. It, it does not apply to the home shares. Okay. And didn't we have language at one point which was, which was a three lot separation or 175 feet, whichever was greater? Yes, that was one of the drafts. Uh, council uh, directed uh, staff to change it to what it is now uh, at the last meeting. Okay. Uh, page 27, it talks about inspection, uh, inspection prior to the permit issuance and every four years thereafter. Um, I hate to say this, but I had a short-term rental experience where I was in a house in, in Los Angeles and uh, my wife and I had a nice bedroom, but the other three bedrooms in the house had two, uh, two sets of bunk beds in each one which I'm convinced was probably not uh, exceeded the occupancy limits that were allowed. Um, should we have a clause in here that allows the city to uh, enter and inspect short-term rentals with, uh, say, with a 24-hour written advance uh, notification to make sure things like that are not going on if necessary? You know, council certainly could consider putting that in. Um, we start to get into the realm of uh, whether or not a warrant is needed uh, to go in or whether we have cause to uh, enter the house. Um, but uh, there are ways to set it up. So, uh, you know, there are inspections being done, but generally speaking, you need cause to, to go in unless you have the owner's consent. Um, Director uh, Graham might be able to speak of some equivalent uh, um, search provisions in the local code, but uh, just a blanket, we get to come in on 24 hours notice without uh, some reason, um, it uh, it starts to become uh, questionable, or at least you need a greater burden than just it's in the code. Yeah, we don't really have anything in the code that would pertain to vacation rentals in the scenario that you described, uh, Council Member Heller. Um, it's not technically a health life safety issue necessarily. Okay, so as it stands, the properties get inspected when the permit is issued and don't get inspected again until four years later? Yes, uh, other than there is an annual self-inspection report that needs to be turned in. And uh, again, these are all good questions and they, uh, based upon my understanding of the months the subcommittee went over this ordinance, uh, you're hitting a lot of the issues that they have discussions about, including um, how often to do the city inspections. Uh, the city manager might be able to provide a little bit more history on um, the four year uh, requirement as opposed to two years, six years. Um, yeah, the four years requirement by the state law uh, that it came into play after the ghost ship uh, tragedy in Oakland. Um, and the city is responsible for um, ensuring that all businesses, including vacation rentals, 
are inspected on a at least on a every four year basis. Um, you know, heavier industrial or commercial uses or have a, an annual inspection. If I'm mistaken, Chief uh, Knuckles, please correct me. But yeah, that that was all part of the discussion with the the community committee. Yeah, and the main component also too is a self inspection program. So that uh, that does meet the state's requirements for us. Um, and, and the reason why we went four year um, self inspection program is because of our workforce size. Um, for us to be able to do inspections of all the ones that we have to do annually, such as hotels, schools, care facilities, and along with uh, uh, vacation rentals um, and uh, B2 occupancies like the brick and mortar retail businesses that we do have, um, we felt that we were able to accomplish 100% of all the inspections if we had it in a four-year program. And um, that's how that's the reason why it's a four-year program is for workforce size. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, on page 29, talking about permit denial, suspension and revocation, has the city revoked any permits in the last couple of years? I mean, what has to happen really uh, for a permit to get revoked? We have not revoked any, as far as I know, any vacation rental uh, permits, and primarily because the ordinance is rather, um, it just doesn't have a lot of teeth in it, the current one and neither does our fine structure for that matter. Um, and that's gonna be resolved through this uh, um, this new ordinance. Um, but uh, you know, we foresee a situation where um, if there's a continual uh, refusal to follow the rules, um, you know, kind of adds up over time, that's gonna lead to suspension. And then if violations continue, uh, the suspension, then it's in the re revocation. Um, however, if there's a, a bad enough incident one time, it could lead to a re revocation of a permit. So a lot of that's just gonna come boil down to the facts, um, you know, going through the due process for, for the violations and, and assessing, you know, how significant the violations were to make those decisions. The committee felt it was important to have a human element in in, in the review of that, which would be either the city manager or if it goes to appeal to the appeal uh, hearing officer to really consider all the facts before making a decision. But if we have the full flexi flexibility to to go to different levels depending on what what has actually occurred and what the facts portray. So Scott, the details about the fines and what activities, how many, you know, complaints or whatever have to happen before these, will that be all developed through resolutions? The fine structure will be developed through resolution. The, what leads to what is, is more of a, uh, it's more of an art form, I would say, and I'm not sure that would, would show up in a resolution. Um, I think that's more about judgment and what the facts on the ground say and what that leads to. It'd be hard to spell out all the different scenarios um, in a resolution. But again, that could be something if we get down the road and we feel that the enforcement's insufficient or um, the good decisions aren't being made by staff or an appealing, um, sorry, appeal hearing officer, uh, we could provide more substance in a resolution to guide those decisions. That's largely up to city council to decide. Okay. Let's see here, in the, on page 30, it talks about parking, which I know has been much discussed and is a major complaint area for some people who live near the full home rentals. And it says must provide sufficient on-site parking spaces. So is sufficient what is required by code for the type of house and the number of bedrooms? Uh, is that what sufficient means? It means that uh, you know it, you can't park off. Uh, you can't park on the street if you're a vacation rental, um, you know, renter. Uh, you have to park on site, and you know, as long as you're parked legally on site, whether in the garage or driveway, um, as much as that can hold, that's how many cars are allowed. So that's I think that's how we're interpreting it. In some cases, uh, a home may have four or five bedrooms, but there's only space enough for three cars. Well, that that's really going to kind of help set the what the occupancy will be. But Scott can probably elaborate a little bit more because there was a lot of discussion in the planning commission about this item. I think that was a good uh, explanation, Scott. Okay. Uh, page 31, talking about no one under 21 is allowed to be the primary 
uh, renter. It's been discussed that uh, many cities make it 25 years. Is that something we can change without a big deal, or we, uh, are we going to stick with the 21? So uh, there's actually a government code which uh, provides that among the many reasons why uh, local land use or uh, zoning permits um, can't or can be issued, uh, issues like race, gender, religion, uh, age is in there. Um, it's a little unclear whether the age is 21 or whether it's just a reasonable age, like 25, based upon the activity. Um, but uh, to make the age restriction um, completely compliant with uh, that government code, uh, my suggestion is that we keep it at 21. I know some cities do uh, increase the age limit uh, to 25. Um, some might even go higher than that. Um, it's unclear whether that's in compliance with uh, state code. Yeah, I have seen a number of cities at 25. Um, let's see here. On page 32, it talks about things that, uh, Chris, you're going to need to help me with again. Uh, public nuisance, infractions, misdemeanors. Can you tell me what the difference are between those? And will that be uh, clarified in some way when the when the uh, various issues are detailed in terms of complaints and what rises to what level of misdemeanor and so forth? Sure. Uh, so um, it can be punished as an infraction or a misdemeanor, any violation of this code. And then uh, the details on the mechanics of prosecuting either an infraction or a misdemeanor are in Chapter 1.16. Um, but understand that uh, the default is that a violation of local co code is a misdemeanor. Cities can make it punishable as either an infraction or a misdemeanor, or they can make it punishable as just an infraction. So saying that you can make it an infraction or a misdemeanor uh, gives flexibility to um, both uh, law enforcement and code enforcement. The basic difference is that um, uh, misdemeanors, uh, worst case scenario, you can go to jail for them. Um, infractions uh, add up to uh, fines that are paid. Um, and as for public nuisance, um, if Actually, uh, the behavior is causing um, uh, a health and safety issue for uh, the public, for the neighbors, then uh, we have put in here expressly that there can be an abatement action, which means that in addition to imposing an infraction or a misdemeanor or an admin site under our local code, um, the uh, city could actually go to court uh, seeking to just shut down the property's use which is an extreme option, but we wanted to make sure every tool available under California law was available in here under penalty enforcement. So um, as time goes by, um, if need be, we have all the tools in our toolbox. Uh, but it would be a rare case, I think, where we would bring um, a public nuisance abatement action uh, against a vacation rental. I think we would exhaust the other remedies first. Okay, and then if we find a, a particular property, how do we how do we collect on those fines? I mean, when the time soon it's time to renew their permit again, do they pay it, or how does that work? Well, once the uh, fines are levied, um, if they don't pay them, um, the city can uh, go ahead and try to collect. I mean, the city can go to uh, small claims court. Um, you know, the city, if it wants to spend the time, can. Uh, put a lien on the property in some circumstances. But uh, yeah, the first step would be when uh, they come in to renew their permit, uh, we could, uh, you know, of course, ask them to uh, clean up the books. That's for sure. Okay. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you, everybody. And uh, if I could, I wanted to just clarify, the thought occurred to me that um, this ordinance is subject to Coastal Commission approval. So earlier I talked about the normal process of after second reading, uh, an ordinance is effective in 30 days. Uh, it's effective for purposes of uh, local procedures in the city, but uh, it won't actually be law until Coastal Commission approves uh, this ordinance which in part is one of the reasons why it's good that the city had so much community involvement because that's a big plus factor for Coastal Commission. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Council Member McPherson, any questions? I do not have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and I have no questions. With that, Anthony, um, I will go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-1 on the agenda. 
Anybody in the queue, sir? Uh, yes, I do see a couple names in the queue. Nicholas Jurin, I believe is how you pronounce the last name. Uh, Nicholas, I have unmuted you, and you are free to give your testimony. Okay. I, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I want to thank everyone for how long this has lasted. Uh, by my calculations, it's it's just coming up on two years, so it's uh, it's nice to have it put to bed and and everybody uh, agreeing on a plan. And and we can promise as as an operator here in Morro Bay that we're going to work with the residents to to make all this work and make make life better for them for all the reasons that we've been discussing for all the last two years. One thing that I want to make note of just so there's uh, so there can be appropriate allowances is uh, you know, we there is a limitation in the new regulation for no more than 10 occupants of a vacation rental. We happen to, and I, I don't have the math in front of me, but we operate either three of the four or four of the five accommodations that are licensed vacation rentals in the city currently that, that occupy up to 12 people. And there is one additional that we don't manage that uh, may be a commercial entity and may be not subject to these rules. But we want to make note of the fact that we do take reservations up to one year in advance and, and pending Coastal Commission approval, certainly at that point, we would absolutely stop taking any of those reservations. But currently we have about 10 reservations on the books. Our guests come from far in the field sometimes across the country, sometimes even from from the European continent. So we want to make sure that there's a provision in the in the works here that when the new regulations do become effective with Coastal Commission, which of course, as promised, we support and we go hand in hand with the city for their approval. But for those existing contracts, we ask for protection. And once this ordinance is approved, we have, of, of course, at that point in time, are happy to provide full details to the city for that exception. So I just want to make sure that uh, that is in the works and taking note of because we wouldn't want to disappoint those guests. And, and we do, and these are only again for contracts that are written with deposits. So that's my only comment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick. Um, Anthony, next public comment. Yes, Mayor. Uh, I see Maggie Jurin. Okay, Maggie, I have unmuted you. You are free to give your testimony, please. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Maggie Duran, and at this point, you have all heard so much from me that I don't think I need to explain further my involvement in the new SDR regulations. Um, first of all, I can't tell you how happy my colleagues and I are to finally be at this point where we are close to finalizing the new SDR ordinance and sending it off to the Coastal Commission. Yay! <laughs> um, thank you all for your attention and tenacity in seeing these regulations through. As Council Member McPherson stated so eloquently last meeting, this has been an exercise of compromise and endurance for all involved. But I truly believe with this ordinance, the city will put in place many regulations that it will allow Morro Bay to continue to offer short-term rentals as a lodging choice for the tourists who choose this, while establishing regulations that will also help the residents to have ways to identify and report those SDRs or illegal rentals that are creating problems for the neighbors. I hope that you all received the correspondence that I submitted for this meeting where I clearly laid out the progression of what I believe ultimately ended up being a mistake in the ordinance. I'm talking about how the three homes on either side plus back and front proximity rule agreed upon by the ad hoc committee evolved into the this plus the addition of the 175 foot linear requirement. And then through what I believe was an omission in the creation of the ordinance, the word linear got left out. This in conjunction with a correspondence sent in by one of the commissioners stating that she thought it was a radius separation triggered a discussion among the council members that resulted in the 175 foot radius requirement superseding the original requirements submitted by the committee. I've gone back and listened to the last meeting again, and I still don't know where this took a wrong term, but I'm asking the council to please revisit this regulation tonight before finalizing this ordinance to make sure that you have considered all the unintended consequences of this decision and to make sure this is really what you want to do versus establishing this requirement based on 
in incorrect data input and some simple misunderstandings. As I said, I tried to document all the different stages of this evolution in the correspondence that I submitted. I appreciate your consideration and further discussion on this issue. Um, and so that's my statement about that. Just real quick, um, uh, Mr. Graham stated that the list the city would provide would provide a list of the of the licensed vacation rentals. I would hope that the city would also publish as part of that the contact number associated with that. And um, and yeah, I'll stop there because I'd like to answer Jeff Heller's question about the one hour response, but I'm done. So thank you guys. And I hope you can have a little bit more discussion about my issue. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Maggie. Um, next public comment, Anthony. Yes, Mayor. Um, I see Betty Winholtz with her hand raised um, and then one other hand raised remaining after that currently, but uh, Betty. Welcome, Betty. I have four comments or questions. Um, the first one has to do with process. Um, if I'm, And I have written in to the Planning Commission and to the City Council before. Will those written comments and or oral comments be sent on to the Coastal Commission uh, when they go to review this document? That's first. Um, second is has to do with the noise ordinance. And when we've had noise issues in the past, one of the um, stumbling blocks seem to be that the police department does not possess an accurate uh, decibel reader. And I'm wondering if that's going to be purchased or if that's going to be part of this ordinance or how that's going to happen so when you get the met metrics to measure noise um, that we actually have the correct tool to do that with. Um, the third comment has to do with um, saying that this um, um, attrition issue of getting it down from 250 to 175, in a previous meeting it was said that was going to take about three years. So I'm wondering why it's now down to one or two years and why that's going to happen quicker than we were told in the beginning. Um, and then I believe that the radius issue uh, was well discussed at the last meeting and I would not want to see that eliminated but kept and and not gone to strictly um, linear. I believe those are all my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Anthony, next public comment, please. Yes, Mayor. Uh, the next public comment would be Robert Elzer. Okay, Robert, you are unmuted and free to give your testimony, please. Welcome, Robert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm going to continue on the comments that Maggie made specifically about the 175 foot radius rule. Um, when the short term committee met, they looked at many different options to create a reasonable separation between vacation rentals. They looked at radius, they looked at some other um, possibilities, and they settled on what we kind of know now as the three home rule. Um, and, they, and they specifically rejected a radius rule because they had input and analysis from the city staff that showed kind of how dramatically that would exclude any possible new entrance into the city as vacation rentals. When they went to the planning commission, the planning commission for the most part agreed with that analysis. They looked at all the same staff reports and maps that had produced The staff did a very good job. Um, but there was some concern that in neighborhoods that had very small lot sizes, that the three home rule wouldn't be enough to create enough separation. So they added the 175 foot rule as basically the greater of 175 or three lots, but that was absolutely intended as a linear separation. It wasn't really designed to alter that basic plan that came out of the committee of the three home rule. Um, when it got to the city council, I think there was maybe some misunderstanding on exactly what the rule meant for a variety of reasons. And it kind of got transformed into this radius rule. Um, but I, I do think there are gonna be some unintended consequences there with a, with a radius rule of 175. You know, you could have someone on the waiting list that's even two streets away from an existing vacation rental and they're excluded and maybe their home doesn't even, or their street doesn't even have a single vacation rental 
on it, most people would not consider that to be overly dense. Most people would consider reasonable to maybe have one vacation rental on that street and they would be excluded. Um, so all I'm asking is for the city council to take a second look at this issue, maybe talk to the staff a little bit and, and review some of that analysis that had been uh, done during the committee and the planning commission. And I asked the council to consider going back to either the committee three home rule or the planning commission three home rule with just the 175 linear and, and not transform that into the radius rule. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, next public comment, Anthony. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that is all. I do not see any more raised hands. That is it for public comment. Thank you. With that, um, I will close public comment for item C-1. Uh, bring it back to council and either entertain a motion or discussion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion. Okay, Councilmember McPherson, go ahead, please. Yes, I move the council adopt by second reading and by title only with further reading waived ordinance number 640 entitled an ordinance of the city council of the city of Morro Bay, California, repealing chapter 5.47 short term vacation rental permit of Title VI Business Tax Certificates and Regulations and adding Chapter 17.41 Short-Term Vacation Rentals of Title 17 Zoning of the Morro Bay Municipal Code pertaining, pertaining to the permitting and operation of short-term vacation rentals. I will second that. So motion by Council Member McPherson for uh, the adoption as per the staff recommendation and uh, seconded by council member Davis. And I'll ask if there's any further discussion on the motion. Uh, I would like to make a few comments if you would permit. So, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanna say that I am supporting this ordinance, not because I agree with everything in it. In fact, I do not. There are a number of provisions in the ordinance that I strongly disagree with. And I'm sure everyone who has an interest in this issue feels the same way. They do not agree with everything in the ordinance, but I am supporting it because I have absolute respect for the process by which we got here. It was a fair, balanced and all inclusive process that relied upon extensive public input and participation and vigorous discussion and debate. And I really don't want to go back and restart any of these discussions. As the mayor mentioned at the beginning, there have been several well-attended public forums held over a number of years. There have been two public citizen surveys conducted, including one by the city that generated more than 560 responses. The Planning Commission addressed the issue in 2018 and again in 2020, holding several well-attended public hearings on the issue. The ad hoc short-term uh, vacation Rental Citizens Committee that was appointed by the city manager held 12 plus lengthy meetings, consulting short-term ordinances from other communities and discussing every detail of the proposed ordinance. I attended every one of those, not as a participant, but as a facilitator along with the mayor. The Morro Bay Chamber of Commerce's Government Affairs Committee reviewed two drafts of the ordinance and provided its comments and recommendations. The T board made recommendations. The council has received hundreds of emails from Morro Bay citizens, property owners and managers, and from people from all over who have visited Morro Bay and stayed in a short-term vacation rental. And this is the third meeting that the council has held on the issue. So I'm supporting this ordinance because it is a compromise among very divergent opinions and perspectives on this important issue that impacts residents, neighborhoods, businesses, and the city itself. And I hope my fellow council members who are support, will support it also so that we can show a unified front to the Coastal Commission, which still has to approve it. This is an ordinance that's been a long time coming and it is long overdue. And everybody should keep in mind that no ordinance is permanent. It can always be revisited and amended. I hope that the council will check in after it's been in effect for a year to evaluate how well it's working. If changes are needed, they can be made then. But for now, we need to have an ordinance in place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other comments? I will just say that I agree with everything that council member McPherson just said, um, it's not a perfect ordinance, but it has been 
arrived at through a great deal of community discussion and it deserves to be passed. Thank you for that. Um, any other comments? I would like to concur with that and uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank Councilmember McPherson for really leading the charge on this, but also another round of thank yous to everybody who participated. I think uh, we've had a lot of information on this ordinance and had a lot of discussion and the community has uh, given an ample amount of input, and I appreciate the sentiment of taking a peek at this a year from now to see how it's working. I do think enforcement is going to be key, and we've talked about that numerous times. Um, so it's going to be incredibly important that we follow through on the enforcement end and make sure uh, that we show the residents of Morro Bay that we are willing to make a change and that we're committed to following through with what we've said. But I appreciate the process here and I'm uh, satisfied enough to start to move this forward. Thank you, Councilmember Addis. Um, any comments, Councilmember Hiller? Uh, yes, I, I think it's been an amazing effort on everybody's part to get to this point. Certainly a long time coming. It's unfortunate that the ordinance uh, was passed that ever was passed that allowed 250 as a cap and the city and its residents have been suffering uh, as a result of that it's hard to rewind that uh, the 175 is a step in the right direction uh, although the process was long and involved lots of people i really feel like the residents of the city have uh, compromise made the major compromises the commercial operations that benefit greatly by operating full home rentals in our neighborhoods benefit greatly from this ordinance i don't think it's going to greatly improve the quality uh, or character of our neighborhoods uh, frankly by grandfathering in uh, all of the operations as far as the density requirement the 175 feet uh, is extremely weak. If you read other ordinances that other cities have adopted, they talk about 200, 250 feet. Los Osos is proposing a 500 foot separation. So I think the management companies uh, maybe should be happy that they got 175 feet. The residents of this city, the ones who have called me, who are concerned, who are unhappy, who complained, are members of our planning commission. They are members of our citizens' advisory boards. They are our neighbors. They are not vocal locals. They are people who care about this community and care about the neighborhoods. We have, I think, by passing this ordinance, taken a step in the right direction. But I believe a year from now, we'll be looking at it again because this is really one of the weakest ordinance on the books that I have found that have addressed this issue or tried to address this issue. I'm sure the Coastal Commission will be happy. I'm sure the rental agencies are happy. Most of the residents that are concerned and impacted by these commercial operations and residential areas are not happy. Thank you, Council Member Heller. And um, so I, uh, you know, I've been involved in this uh, process almost from the very beginning, including the initial establishment <clears throat> through an urgency ordinance of the 250 uh, cap, and then uh, was involved in the initial subcommittee that looked at uh, taking input from the public um, and um, had uh, at least two meetings um, over two years ago where we had um, more than uh, 200 individuals for both meetings attend and, and provide um, comments with regard to that to the subcommittee. Um, I also um, had the opportunity to be involved in the community committee that uh, Mr. Collins convened, uh, which included a cross section of not only vacation rental owners, um, um, hosted versus non hosted property managers, um, and neighborhood residents. And 
Um, the, the robustness of that process makes me very proud. Um, myself and council member McPherson were merely facilitators. We offered no opinions uh, during those meetings and, and, and tried to uh, synthesize along with Mr. Collins the input that was given. And I believe we, we probably um, reached consensus on about 90% of the items that were considered. That's just my estimation. But but I um, must tell you, it's one of the most robust, I think, and, and most inspirational processes that I've been involved with in terms of the, the open dialogue and exchange and respect for uh, one another that that team had. And I'm, I'm very proud of them and uh, proud to be part of that process. Um, I also, um, in, in deference to Council Member Hiller, um, don't think this that this is one of the weakest ordinances on the book. I don't I don't think there's a standard ordinance that applies um, that works for all communities. Um, during our process uh, with our convened community team, we looked at over um, uh, 30 different uh, ordinances that various cities had adopted and. Um, that was a good uh, template or benchmark to get an idea of, I think, the categories for consideration that were looked at by uh, this team and provided a good template of um, what needed to be included in an ordinance. I'm also proud of how um, our legal team was able to translate um, all of the information and notes that were taken during those meetings into um, the legal terminology required for such an ordinance. Not um, um, an easy task, in my opinion, uh, but a very difficult task. And so I'm, I'm very uh, pleased with the work that was done by our city attorney and group uh, with regard to that. No vacation rental ordinance for the city of Morro Bay will please everybody, um, as we all know. I think this is fair and balanced with regard to um, neighborhoods with regard to uh, property managers, with regard to city finances and maintaining the integrity of that, and also consideration for private property owners' rights that have participated as owners of uh, vacation rentals and um, licensees, so to speak. Um, I do believe that um, significant teeth will be added in the form of not only fines, but permit fees, um, there's also a significant educational component that will be included, not necessarily within the ordinance, but will come as um, a resolution and or policy recommendation to the city council. And I look forward to the opportunity to um, not only um, strengthen enforcement, um, which I do believe through no fault of the city um, is weak right now, um, but I do believe that financially now, uh, we will have, as our master fee schedule gets amended, um, the fees uh, generated to be able to provide for additional code enforcement to really make this thing work. I also believe it will improve public safety um, with regard to the issues that have been noted in the ordinance that refer specifically to safety requirements and other requirements um, that I believe are designed to not only protect um, the individual homeowner, but also individuals who rent the properties. I must say that um, I, um, I'm very thankful again, um, and I know we've repeated it many times, also to our TBID board, to our um, planning commission, uh, to the public that has given so many, uh, given so much public comment. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, with regard to Ms. Weinholz's uh, comments, I do believe that um, all public comment will be forwarded to the Coastal Commission and staff can clarify that if I'm wrong there. Um, and the noise, noise ordinance for the last meeting will be agendized and I appreciate her comments regarding looking at specifics for decibels and the appropriate equipment that might be necessary to measure that. So it's with that that I also um, do support the motion and I will ask the clerk if she would call the question, please. Council Member McPherson? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Heller? No. Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 4-1. Thank you. 
that ends uh, that item, and that brings us to item C-2. This is a review of the uh, Morro Bay Emergency Plan and consideration for the adoption of Resolution 94-20, City of Morro Bay Emergency Management Plan, adding pandemic continuity of operations annex. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to Chief Knuckles, sir. Great, and uh, good evening. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull up uh, the PowerPoint for this. Um, you know, what a, um, what a year. Um, who would have thought that we would uh, be doing this, doing having an emergency hazard that affects 100% of our citizens, 100% of our workforce, 100% of our leadership. Um, you know, if when we have a, a tsunami or an earthquake or a fire coming towards our town, it doesn't affect everyone. It may affect maybe 10, 20, 30% of our community. Uh, we have our infrastructure still in place. We have our workforce in place. And uh, definitely this is uh, a new one for the books about uh, how it affects everyone, not just in our community, but our state, nation, and also the world. And, uh, and Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for, uh, not just for the last, um, um, update on COVID. You have been so concise with uh, the updates you give uh, on all the meetings that you attend, the meetings you attend with the, um, the command staff at the EOC, and uh, um, you have been uh, uh, basically a uh, great knowledge base, especially being a doctor as yourself, knowing, understanding uh, the concepts of uh, um, pandemics. But you know, our infection rate at 0.06% didn't happen by accident. It happened by a willing government to lead uh, it, uh, having a plan that works and uh, a community that is willing to accept it. You know, our national average is 2.6, where Morro Bay is at 0 0.06. And again, that didn't happen by accident. That happened by good planning, leadership and involvement of our community. So um, I'd like to recommend that, uh, and staff recommends the city council to adopt resolution 94-20, accepting the revised city Morro Bay emergency management plan, adding NXL, panic, uh, pandemic con continuity of operations plan. This is very similar when I came to you guys back exactly almost a year ago for our public safety po uh, power shutoff plan that we have uh, currently right now in the plan. Uh, because we're making changes to the uh, basic plan, part one of the emergency plan, and that's why I need to come back to you to um, basically um, to approve it by uh, resolution. Um, and uh, um, our first EOC was opened up with a plan very similar to this um, back in 1999 during the, um, the Y2K scare that we had. And probably the most significant before the uh, pandemic was we opened up the EOC in 2003 for a hazmat spill on Beach Street that we had to evacuate uh, close to 6,000 people in our community and get everyone back into their home and open up the streets for our Harbor Festival, which started the next day. Um, so we, we have opened this uh, um, our EOC seven times since 1999. Um, so basically, since March 16th, our Morro Bay Operations Center has been uh, open to support not only the federal, state, but our local public health emergency. Um, We've been 100% virtual, which had some challenges, but also had some great benefits about um, the time efficiency and, uh, um, and communication. I think we've done a great job on uh, virtually having our meetings, um, and we've been 100% virtual from day one. Um, our operational periods are, are clear cut with incident action plans that are defined by National Incident Management System and ICS. Uh, so far, we've had about 23 different operational periods uh, since March, and here Here's our latest one, and it's up on the cover there also. Um, this is uh, this operational period ends next Monday. Right now, we're developing a plan for the next two weeks, um, starting on Monday. Uh, the EOC command staff and planning personnel has met multiple times, and right now we have about 28 employees and volunteers that are part of our EOC uh, planning staff. Um, the EOC is focused on serving and safeguarding and protecting um, our community, and our EOC has been operating for 226 days. Um, I don't know how long we're going to be going with this. Um, who knows? But I wouldn't be surprised if we um, go for another 226 days. And uh, we couldn't do this without the leadership that starts with the city council, uh, starts off with our, our city attorney, our city manager, and our finance director that held so many hats in our EOC. I can't talk higher of Jennifer, and she definitely was uh, um, um, not only a great friend, but a great asset to our Mercy Operations Center. 
Um, so I really want to concentrate on what we have accomplished um, as an EOC since March 16th. Uh, we have created a safer worker environment, and that's thanks to Scott Collins and Dana um, Swanson for not only being taking a bold change to our, the work environment of the city employees, uh, but also developing policies to support that. Uh, we maintain our state of readiness in all of our departments, not just on emergency, but uh, we still have sewer treatment water. We still have public works working out on the street. Uh, we still have uh, a recreation department assisting with uh, creative enrichment programs and pod education. education. Uh, we have new protection policies and provided 100% of PPE to all city workforce and volunteers. Uh, we were very fortunate and jumped on quickly and we maintained our PPE storage for our city employees and volunteers and we have never run out and currently we have about four months supply ready to attack the next four months. Uh, we developed a program through volunteerism uh, to support our vulnerable population through our CERT and uh, program and uh, also uh, two great volunteers led it for us, uh, both uh, uh, Marty and Ronnie Lamalley. I, I can't speak higher for them. They stepped up, ran this Morro Bay Cares program. We were the first program in the county, uh, especially when the private sector didn't help support our vulnerable population. Uh, we helped out over 130 households in our community by providing food, um, medications, hearing aids, reading materials um, that uh, we really, um, a lot of volunteers stepped up and our CERT team really stepped up by making phone calls every day at 11 o'clock to all those uh, residents to make sure that when they're okay, if they need any Thing. And I think that the biggest success of the program was just hearing the human voice every day at 11 o'clock from someone else in the community. And I think that really helped out a lot of our citizens. Um, we also uh, had to work side by side with our county EOC and public health department. Uh, I know, Mr. Mayor, you've been attending many uh, meetings. Uh, um, our city manager, Scott, uh, Scott Collins, had attended the city manager meetings, making some policy direction for the whole county as whole. Our liaison officer's been attending meetings, and then I've been in constant communication with our EOC and public health. I can't speak higher of our county partners in this and, and their willingness to communicate with the cities and the county um, as a whole. Um, we also developed a traffic and rock parking plan to assist our high visitor rates. I think we all seen the pictures when we looked at the uh, Morro Bay Rock and simply by placing lines I know it sounds simple, but placing lines on a rock parking lot, we probably added the capacity of one third, allowing us to give room for emergency access for emergency calls out there. Uh, I was recently out there a couple weekends ago and it was a madhouse out there, but, but because of the parking lanes and the traffic flow pattern we have now, it was very attainable to get to the emergency on the rock parking lot. And thanks for the Harbor Department for coming up with that. Uh, we developed educational campaigns plus methods to, great act, uh, to recognize great actions by our community, by Morro Bay Face Mask Hero, Morro Bay Trash Hero, and soon coming out will be Roll Up Your Sleeve because we'll be hopefully hosting some uh, free flu shots, get uh, mobile drive through uh, flu shots, getting us ready for our point of distribution for possible COVID vaccines coming to us to get to our, our community. And uh, again, I, I, Jennifer Calloway has a great marketing mind. She was a great information officer. She was much more to us than and just a simple finance director. And uh, I really cherish uh, um, what the work she did um, helping us out. And also in addition, we have uh, Amy uh, Watkins, our commander, police commander, that uh, took over on the social media side, not just for her department, but for the city and also the fire department. So we uh, organized uh, social media uh, messaging um, that went out to all of our um, folks and also even went out next door. And uh, Commander Amy, uh, she did a great job at that. And, uh, um, I am so glad that she's part of our team. Um, we continue with, uh, um, we kept our public and workforce informed through an aggressive public and social media program. And we also coach and encourage our business community. And with a partnership with uh, Erica Crawford and the Chamber of Commerce, Scott Graham and his team, um, they did a great job of uh, not only just going out and enforcing the, the rules that we had during the different openings and real tiers and, and instruction, especially at the beginning, um, we, we adopted the, the philosophy, we're gonna coach and encourage. Um, I might even send out seasonal firefighters out uh, when I had opportunities just to go out with the forms and just give encouragement and coach our businesses how they should be operate during that particular tier. 
Um, we support our community's children by providing enrichment programs and distant learning programs. Uh, Kirk um, Carmichael and the rec department has done a great job in partnership with the county, also with the school district on uh, providing enrichment programs for some of our kids and also pod education through the school district to help the kids that really needed help um, that they were having a hard time with the social distancing and the virtual um, education that they're getting. And uh, I think one of the strongest moves we made at the beginning was uh, we maximized our cost recovery programs through FEMA and CARES funding, and we put one person in charge of the data collection. That was Damaris um, of our uh, Public Works Department. Uh, she's done a phenomenal job help maximizing our cost recovery um, through those programs. So in preparation, so we started um, um, our continuation of operations plan development in late uh, 2019. Actually, in November, uh, we had a discussion at a staff meeting and under the direction of the city manager, we started looking at it because we knew sooner or later the pandemic was going to hit our, our coastline. And uh, our uh, current uh, <clears throat> pandemic uh, operations plan is based off a plan that we developed in 2009 for the H1H1 virus planning and response plan that developed our uh, point of distribution at the fire station for influenza shots. Well, thank God that nothing came out much out of that, but it was a good tool, though, to use our, for our current pandemic. Um, at that time, we also recognized that both regional partnership and approach was extremely important because a lot of communities like ourselves, so we're limited in our resources, and uh, we had been using our pandemic plan as a guideline because it complies with the National Incident Management System, NIMS, um, that which is part of part one that you guys are going to hopefully um, approve for um, approval by uh, resolution tonight. So for the continuity, basically uh, we're going to be adding a new hazard annex to our Morbay Emergency Management Plan. And that's part two of the plan. And those are our hazard annexes. And that's where we have for floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, mass casualty, Diablo Canyon, nuclear accidents. Those are all guidelines to help us out. So when it's two o'clock next Tuesday morning that we kind of have a good understanding how we're going to run the incident. But the framework of how we do it in the planning process and the objective-based systematic approach is all in part one of the basic plan. And that talks about incident management system. It talks about uh, national incident management system and, and uh, how the federal government and the state requires us to follow those rules to uh, make sure that we have a good running uh, emergency incident, but also they make it requirements for future um, reimbursement. Um, our new hazard annex is in concert with the other hazards such as flood, earthquakes, and tsunami, so that we, um, um, it looks exactly the same like uh, the nuclear power plant one, so that uh, um, we are following the same type of guidelines. It complies with state and federal mandates that will function well regionally and would qualify for possible assistance. Um, our emergency plan, uh, which was adopted by your council um, two years ago, um, fits our new FEMA Homeland Security crosswalk guidelines so we can have a city manager from Glendale come up all the way up to Morro Bay and be our um, planning section chief. And our plan is going to look very similar to their plan. I think that's one of the benefits of the, the federal government and the state state government requiring that we all use the same type of incident management system. And this uh, new addition um, does require the council to adopt our basic plan because we added one more annex in there and about two or three paragraphs describing that annex. That's why I'm here for tonight to talk about that, uh, to hopefully that uh, we can adopt our plan to um, absorb this pandemic plan. So the objectives of our panic uh, continuing of operations plan, NXL, is to provide for the safety for the public, employees, and volunteers, ensure there's uninterrupted emergency services or PD, fire department, and harbor department, ensure the continuity of uh, government capabilities at all levels, institute preventive measures in all study workplaces like we did. And uh, I think that uh, really helped reduce the stress of our city employees and uh, um, especially at the beginning when we had a lot of uncertainty. I think uh, um, um, our city manager's decision to to make, a, it was an unpopular decision to some in the community, but I believe that um, it's kept our employees safe. And uh, you know, right now we've only had one employee that has tested COVID positive. And that's pretty remarkable with uh, um, how much contact we have with the citizens. Um, we provide for timely and accurate information to a wide range of mediums, and that's using social media, that's using paper, um, that's using videos. Um, 
uh, to our community and also to our workforce. Ensure coordination with law enforcement to maintain um, protection. And uh, uh, Chief uh, Cox and his team um, have done a great job at the beginning, um, knowing what to enforce, what not to enforce, what could they could enforce. And uh, again, I think uh, we all adopted and had major discussions about coaching. And they had def definitely been a big part of the coaching element that we have with our community. Um, we want to ensure the needs of our medically dependent individuals and functional needs as assisted and, and are assisted. And um, with our morbid cares program right at the beginning when the private sector didn't have much programs uh, to help uh, our vulnerable population, um, I, I believe we filled that hole all the way up to August 1st. And that's how long we ran the morbid cares program. Today, there's a lot of uh, private um, and public um, resources out there where our vulnerable population can get this their services to get their groceries delivered, medications delivered, or pretty much anything taken to their house. Um, we want to ensure our close coordination and communications with our regional partners, which is mostly county health department. We want to ensure that the, all our management actions and efforts will be focused on serving and safeguarding and protecting the community of Morro Bay. That is our number one objective. And we also want to maintain our accurate financial documentation, which is necessary for all cost reimbursement through the state of California, also with, um, um, with the federal government. So um, staff recommends the council to uh, adopt resolution 9420, uh, accepting the revised city of Morro Bay emergency management plan, adding Annex L panic, pandemic continuity of operations plan. And I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Chief. Uh, appreciate the very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask if there are any council questions. Council member Davis, um, any questions, sir? I do not have any questions. Okay, Council Member Heller, questions? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Chief, if I could ask you kind of an off topic uh, question. I saw a note about the county, I believe, is asking for face masks. And I know this is kind of unrelated to your report, but do you know anything about uh, that or whether there's a shortage or not? No, I'm going to be honest. Uh, we haven't had, when I mean, we had some difficult times, I mean, it's taken work um, to get our face masks, um, but um, they're out there. Um, and also the California Office of Emergency Services does have a stockpile that I was able to ac access a couple times. So I, I've never, I haven't heard that yet from the county, um, but um, your city is um, fully stocked. Um, and our goal is to have a four month supply um, going all the time. And right now we have a four month supply. Okay, thank you. Thank you for taking that question. Appreciate it. That's all I have, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, Council Member McPherson, any questions? Uh, I had some questions, but uh, the chief has answered all of my questions. The only one that um, I think I would ask you at this point, um, uh, just for the sake of all the people watching, you did not have a plan in place for a pandemic specifically uh, when this started, and yet um, you seem to have managed it well. And I'm just wondering how that happened and what you learned from that experience. Well, thank you, uh, Councilman McPherson. You made me write down a lot of stuff to really think and reflect of what's been going on the last few months. And uh, you're right, we didn't have a pandemic plan. But when we go back to 1999, we didn't have a Y2K plan. And uh, because the basis, the framework, the planning, the systematic approach to the objectives that we use for emergency management is all defined in part one, all in those 29 pages. And that's what we train on. And uh, so, very similar, like uh, the fire that's down in Orange County, uh, um, the, um, uh, what's it called? The, oh, the Silverado fire down in Orange County. They are operating their emergency operations center at the county level the same way we're operating ours, addressing this pandemic issue. We just have to cap, we just have a different set of objectives. So uh, just like in Y2K, we didn't really have a annex for it. Um, and, uh, but we are able to make that work. A annex is just a tool for us to use to uh, give us brain teasers, to address issues that are well thought out. And, uh, and what I love about our type of emergency management plan is that the annexes can be changed at any day. They can be changed when we have changes in uh, policies or changes in resources available to us. And we don't have to take that back to the council because those are tactics, how we're going to fight the problem. But the policy and the direct and the strategy um, is all in part one, which you are going to be hopefully approving the um, changes we make today. So that's how we made it work. We just followed that plan. And uh, you're right, it was, uh, um, um, 
It didn't happen by accident. It took a, a work from a lot of people to make it work. So some of the things that I've learned, um, and I do have a list about, I do apologize, about 21 items, 22 items, and most of them are positive because of uh, the great workforce that we have. So one thing, the first thing and the most of our, our merchant plan works, and uh, it worked with a systematic objective-based planning. And uh, um, it, it, from day one, it, it worked. And this is not the first time I've seen this work. I've been on incident management teams up and down the state of California. We use the same process for every, from earthquakes to fires. And uh, um, that's what I love about the system. It's, very, it's the same every time. Um, we have one of the lowest infection rates in our county and, and no deaths. That's the end result. Um, it's amazing that we uh, what, 0.06. I mean, that's amazing uh, for our community. And again, that didn't happen by accident. That took a little work from a lot of people. Um, you know, we're, uh, we have an unknown ending. We don't know. Usually when we have tsunami, fire, earthquake, we kind of know in a few days that the majority of the hard work is going to be done. But um, let's be honest, I, I really believe that it's a possibility we're going to have our EOC and our emergency declaration working for another year. Um, and uh, that's what we're planning for and we're going to be prepared for. Um, our city employees and volunteers are awesome. Um, I, I can't talk more about the, our community, um, the job set skills that they have, and uh, they all stepped up. Uh, especially our city workforce. Um, not only did they have to do their day-to-day -day job, but then we added EOC work on top of that. And uh, I'm so happy with our, our workforce and our community. Um, we always want to plan two months ahead. Um, we have some very creative people that created programs to meet the needs of our unique community. Um, we uh, assigned one person to collect and organize our cost recovery, which I uh, mentioned earlier. Damaris has done a great job with that. Our citizens want to help our neighbors, and we learned quickly that we need to develop a program to absorb them into it and help everyone stay focused on the major needs, and that's uh, through our Murray Bay CARES program and our CERT program that worked well. Um, we want to utilize the state OES PPE storage as early as fast as possible, and uh, we're constantly bugging them for more free PPE. As I like the word free. Um, it's great to have our volunteers lead our manager programs like uh, Marty and Ronnie Lamelli. Um, they not only they brought new ideas, energy, um, focus, and uh, and definitely they had the job set skills to to make that program fly like it did. Um, an early response to meet the needs of our vulnerable population was not only the right thing to do, but it also helped our workforce because it prevented future larger problems down the road. Um, that's how I see it. Um, we decreased our employee COVID stress quickly by addressing our employee PPE needs, radical changes in our work environment, and new policy development. And that comes from uh, our city manager and our risk manager. They, they did a great job and worked quickly to make sure that our employees feel secure working in their jobs. Um, we addressed our traffic and parking flow issues at Morro Bay Rock, and my gosh, that was a big task. Um, Everyone led by an example, um, and that includes the city council, our, our city mayor attending all the meetings that he did, every city manager, correction, our city manager, our department heads, our mid managers attended every meeting on time, focused, and uh, um, um, they led and led by an example for the rest of the workforce. Um, what was tough on the city employees, let's be honest, was the um, the budget reductions and the layoffs. That kind of brought morale down, but it was, but we had to get, uh, um, but we had to concentrate on the COVID situation. Um, addressing our COVID stress with our employees and volunteers is a constant moving target. We're always trying to find ways to reduce the stress load on our volunteers and our workforce. And uh, um, this is one that was really, to me, you know, I mean, I'm a um, human person, and the lack of human contact with other team members has been tough and all. Um, I get so excited when I get to see someone across the street and uh, talk to them in person. And there's many more. But uh, what I got out of this so far is that the positive um, work of the many volunteers in our workforce that's making this work. And again, that 0.06% didn't happen by accident, happened by a work of many. And uh, uh, thank you, Council McPherson, for uh, making me do that uh, homework assignment. And, and thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Council Member Addis, any questions? No questions from me. Thank you. And um, that will bring us to public comment. Um, I'll go ahead and ask Anthony. Uh, this is a public comment for item C-2 on the agenda. Do we have any public comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. 
Okay, I'll go ahead and um, close public comment, bring it back to council. Uh, perhaps uh, I could open it up and say, um, without a doubt, um, I am, just grabbing my notes here, I am uh, so extremely proud uh, of you, Chief, uh, for your uh, tremendous organizational skills um, and the remainder of the team. Uh, I wrote down some notes. I've had the opportunity to be involved from the very beginning of the creation of the EOC. It's been a pleasure to participate on that. Um, what I have sensed is uh, a tremendous amount of uh, significantly well-organized objectives that are updated um, weekly, uh, now um, on an every other week basis. Um, significant collaboration among team members, and that includes the department heads that you've mentioned and other members um, of the team. Um, uh, execution of the plan, um, impeccable, um, outstanding. Um, what can I say? Um, communication um, in between meetings has been um, also quite excellent, keeping us aware of any issues that have popped up in between that we needed to be aware of. Um, your ability to hold people accountable in a kind and caring manner, um, I've appreciated very much. Um, I know sometimes that's difficult, but, but in times of pandemics or when you're in an emergency situation, strong accountability is key um, and I wrote down the word nimble. Um, you, the response when changes were necessary, when, when um, organizationally there were demands that required new allocation of resources, your team, uh, the team was right there making that happen and I credit your leadership to that. And then the partnerships on a countywide basis with other entities and organizations, the collaboration, absolutely critical, the attention to detail with regard to state uh, CDC, um, as well as local public health mandates, um, well done, well executed. And uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that you, the team, and uh, team has done. And I want to uh, compliment as well, um, obviously, Mr. Collins. Um, it's your leadership and inspiration that creates good people that want to execute and do um, good work, and I appreciate that. And even though um, we don't have Mrs. Ms. Calloway present, um, I do want to recognize her as well uh, for her tremendous contributions to this plan as well. I also believe as a result of the plan and the organization that it will lend itself to the city being able to recoup um, um, fair reimbursement, although there's not a lot of money there, but in terms of the FEMA-related uh, reimbursement, um, that requires a lot of documentation and the way that, again, um, you've been organized and the team is executed, I believe we're capturing cost information that will assist us at least in getting some um, um, dollars back for the city. So with that, um, I am happy to recommend uh, the adoption by, excuse me, the adoption of resolution number 94-20, accepting the revised City of Morro Bay Emergency Management Plan, uh, adding Annex L Pandemic Continuity of Operations Plan. Second that motion. Motion by Mayor Heading for the staff recommendation, second by Council Member McPherson. Any other comments? Yeah, I just wanna jump in and uh... Time, times two, what you said, Mayor. Uh, Chief, I couldn't be prouder of you and the team and police department and everybody who's worked under remarkable challenging conditions, uh, just doing an outstanding job. I never worry about you guys and you just cover the bases. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Uh, just a ditto for me. I want to echo the same comment. So thank you so much for everything. And I am so proud of our city and, and the city staff. I truly am. So thank you for everything you've done. Mr. Bradis? I would, yeah, I would concur with that. I've just felt like since the beginning that um, Morro Bay has been a leader since Think, you know, since we first shut down in mid-March, I felt like everybody hit the ground running um, on the staff side, on the volunteer side, 
And I think we've been a leader across the county. I feel really good about that. And I want to echo what the chief said, that it really does show in the low numbers here. And I hope that we can continue that, uh, continue our social distancing and our mask wearing and our uh, cream of the crop practices. I really just appreciate all the work that you've done on this, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Davis, any comments? No, just congratulations to Chief Knuckles for a great job. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. With that, we'll do a roll call vote, please. Mayor Heading. Yes. Council Member McPherson. Yes. Council Member Addis. Yeah. Council Member Davis. Yes. And Council Member Heller. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Great. Thank you again, Chief, and please extend our thanks to the remainder of the team. Uh, with that, that'll bring us to item C-3, consideration of resolution for 180-day wait period exception for CalPERS retired annuitant, interim finance director appointment and interim finance director agreement with Katie Lichtig. And I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Collins. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mayor, Council Members, and community members. Um, this should be a brief uh, presentation and happy to answer any questions. And Ms. Lichtig is also on the uh, Zoom if you have any questions for her. Um, as you all know, uh, Ms. Callaway, who is our Finance Director, Acting Public Works Director, and PIO, our Public Information Officer, uh, resigned on the 23rd of October to accept a position of Town Manager with Truckee, and she was just sworn in at 5 p.m. this evening. Um, so we're all very proud of her, uh, but obviously her departure leaves a big uh, hole in our um, finance team. Um, she's put together a really solid finance team, and so we're in good shape at the sort of uh, everyday work level, but certainly need to maintain the strategic oversight of that um, department as well as the overall city finances. And so um, shortly after being notified that uh, Jen was going to uh, move forward with that um, opportunity, um, I looked into several different firms and individuals who were open recruitment for an interim finance director position, knowing it would probably be hard to pull off a uh, permanent position at this time, uh, recruitment that is. And so uh, over the first couple of weeks of October, looked into several different um, uh, opportunities and individuals, and uh, one, one individual rose to the top based upon qualifications as well as um, understanding of our community and um, just uh, word of mouth from folks who, who know her and worked with her, and that's uh, Ms. Ms. Kay Lichte, who's the former city manager for the city of Slow, as well as Malibu before that, and most recently as the chief operating officer and um, assistant city manager for the city of Santa Monica. Um, she has been instrumental in those organizations and helping those cities uh, through the good and bad times financially over her 30-year career. Um, and before that, she, she moved into local government. She worked for the Budget Management Office for the, um, the the federal government. So a wealth of experience on the budget side and leadership side, which we certainly want to carry forward in, um, during this interim period while we conduct a, a search for a permanent replacement for Jen. Um, uh, one one caveat with, with Ms. Listig is she retired uh, less than six months ago, and the PERS system uh, typically won't allow uh, a new attempt to begin work uh, until after six months, but there are several exceptions within the government code, uh, primarily around ensuring that it's necessary to fill a critically needed position before 180 days have passed and that the appointment has been approved by the governing body of the employer in a public meeting. Uh, hence, we are here tonight. Uh, we believe it is imperative that we have uh, uh, this individual in the position uh, without delay so that we can continue uh, to weather COVID and start to set the city on, um, or continue the, the work that we've been put in place with Ms. Callaway to set us on a good course financially. Um, so I feel very confident in her ability to lead um, and help me lead uh, the organization and council lead the organization through COVID-19. Uh, we anticipate a recruitment will take anywhere from two to six months, just depending on the quality of applications that come through. Um, we have allowed through the contract for this to run for one year in case we aren't successful in bringing somebody on board. We don't want to settle. Um, certainly, Ms. Cowway set the bar extremely high, and um, 
and rightfully so, we deserve uh, somebody of that caliber and won't take anything less. So um, we wanna make sure we do a robust recruitment and bring somebody on board. So this contract provides flexibility in case that takes longer than we anticipate. Um, we expect that Ms. Listig will work a regular 40 hour a week schedule um, until the duration of her work is completed. The compensation will be the, the top end salary rate um, for the finance director position of $67.09 an hour uh, with no benefits. Um, and again, she will be an at will employee just like all the other department heads that work under the city manager. Um, so with that, uh, we recommend adoption of resolution 9520, approving the exception to the 180 day waiting period for the position of interim finance director and approve the interim finance director employment agreement between the city and Ms. Lichtig. And Dana Swanson is on the call. She can answer any kind of the PERS related questions if you have them. And of course, if you have any questions for myself or Katie, we're available as well. Thank you, Scott, very much, appreciate that. I'll go ahead and open it up for any council questions. Um, start off with council member um, um, Addis, any questions? No, I don't have any questions. Okay, council member McPherson, any questions? I do not have any questions, thank you. Council member Davis? I do not have any questions and I'm delighted that Ms. Lichtig is a potential employee. Great, Council Member Heller. I have no questions, thank you. Great, and I have no questions as well. Um, very succinct report and very comprehensive as well. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and open up public comment. This is public comment for item C-3 on the agenda. Any member of the public wishing to um, give public comment, please do so now. And uh, Anthony. Any Mr. public comment, sir? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any raised hands in the queue. All right, I will go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to council and entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move that council adopt resolution number 95-20, approving an exception to the 180 day waiting period for the position of interim finance director and approve the interim finance director employment agreement between the city and Ms. Lichtig. I will second that. Motion by Council Member Davis for the staff recommendation, seconded by Council Member McPherson. Um, any other discussion or comments? I would just like to say that I am absolutely delighted that uh, Ms. Lichtig has uh, agreed to do this, and I wish that I was going to stay on the council to work with her. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <you're leaving. laughs> Well, uh, it's too late to change your mind. <laughs> I know, I'm aware of that, but I, I met her at a League of California Cities uh, meeting and I was so impressed by her and I certainly watched her when she was in, in San Luis Obispo City um, as their finance director. So I just know we're gonna be in good hands. So I'm so grateful she agreed to do this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for that, yes. Any other comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah, I would like to echo those comments. Uh, Katie, welcome aboard. Uh, sounds like you have an outstanding background. I'm so happy to have you uh, and you're helping us in the nick of time. Thank you so much. Uh, other comments, thank you for that. Yeah, welcome, Katie. I'm so glad you'll be with Morrow Bay. We're excited and I'm glad that it's a seamless transition. So happy to have you here. Well, um, I'll echo all of those comments. Katie, welcome back, uh, not to Morro Bay, but back to the area. Um, I had a very brief uh, time to work with Katie when she was at San Luis Obispo. Couldn't be more pleased or delighted for you, Mr. Collins. Um, you've got a, a great um, individual I know that you're bringing into the organization that will um, help you in these difficult times. And I very appreciate, very much appreciate, Katie, your consideration of coming back to work so far after, um, so soon, I mean, after um, your career, basically um, a, a stellar career um, and a well-deserved uh, retirement. But I know because of your endless energy that um, you probably couldn't wait to get back to get to work anyway. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and call uh, for a uh, roll we'll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Yes, and go Dodgers. <laughs> Council Member McPherson. Yes. Council Member Addis. Yes. 
Council Member Heller? Yes. And Mayor Heading? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Um, that brings us to item D, uh, Council Declaration of Future Agenda Items. We have a pretty stacked list of stuff, but if you have anything that's extremely important, we'll, we'll go ahead and listen. Hearing none, I'll close uh, item D um, and um, go ahead and adjourn the meeting. The next regular meeting of the City of Morro Bay City Council will be held on Tuesday, November 10th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. via teleconference. Thank you, good evening, be safe and be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Go Giants. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> good night, all. Good night.